What a beautiful song that symbolizes your love for us. The greatest sacrifice that ever was made on our behalf, a lost race. You came, Father, in the form of your Son. You gave all to us. As we contemplate your great love for us this morning, I'm asking for a blessing, number one, to use me as a channel of grace. I'm asking, Father, that you bless this audience today, this, these, these children of yours, with the presence of Christ in a very special way. I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to come over their hearts and convict them of the love of Jesus. I'm asking for them to not leave this church without knowing that they are totally forgiven in Christ. I'm asking, Father, that your Holy Spirit will bring righteousness and judgment to this church. I'm asking for the YouTube audience that's listening right now that you will reach out and bless them as well as they hear this message of truth coming from your lips. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here again to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I have a, 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 a fantastic message for you today in the Lord. I preached this message once in the Spanish church. Jesus is, is on his way to, the, to Jerusalem, the Passover feast. In six days, Jesus will be crucified. Jesus knows this. And as he is on his way to Jericho, just above the hill, he's looking forward to being with Lazarus and Mary and Martha, whom he loved. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. And in Matthew, this, this story is a fantastic story that's told for the whole world to know. Just as Jesus' life was a whole testimony, in this one event, the alabaster box, Jesus' oil spilt over his love symbolized the cross, symbolized the fragrance of love for a dying, perishing race. Jesus gave all, and Mary gave all. Let's learn about this story. This story is, a, is one of the most important stories in the Bible because it's told in four different Gospels. Whenever a story is told in four different Gospels, it's a very important subject. So let's look at it. Matthew 6, 26, 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, where is, where is Jesus? At the house of Simon the leper. This is where the feast is. John 12, 1. Let's read about it. When does this take place? Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, six days before the crucifixion. So six days before the crucifixion, Jesus is in the house of Simon the leper. Let's read Mark, Mark 14, 3 says, Being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flask and poured it on his head. Now let's meet one of the guests. Simon was a Pharisee. Let's read about that. Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down. Simon, the Pharisee, was, a, he was healed from leprosy. He was no longer a leper. He was grateful for being healed from leprosy. He held the feast in honor of Jesus. Would you be grateful if you were healed from leprosy? Or let's say, let's say today would be cancer. Would you be grateful? Yes. 
And si so it was, Simon was grateful that, his, that the Lord had healed him from this deadly disease. It was a disastrous disease in that time. As you know, leprosy was considered to be a stigma of judgment from God. It was considered in ancient times to, to be a, a, a symbol of sin. So we have Simon, who is healed from leprosy. He's a Pharisee. Now, now we want to focus on the second character of our story, Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Let's read about that. John 11, 1 and 2. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, who wiped his feet and hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So it was this same Mary, also known as Mary Magdalene. She was known all over the countryside as a professional prostitute. She was known as a great sinner because she was a great sinner. Jesus acknowledged her sins in chapter 7 of Luke. He says her sins were many. We know that she was, from historical evidence, that she was a professional prostitute. And she was demon-possessed. And she was demon-possessed many times. Let's read about that. Mark 16, 9. Now when he rose early in the first day, he appeared to first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast out seven demons. This was the same Mary who was known as a professional prostitute. In that society, she was looked upon as a scum of the earth. The lowest of society... Jesus was often criticized for helping people like Mary. The pen of inspiration says in 568, Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that shaped her life. He may have extinguished every spark, he might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul. But he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the de demons that controlled her heart and her mind. She had heard the strong cries to the Father on her behalf. She knew how offensive, how offensive is sin to his unsullen purity, she writes. In his strength, she had overcome. And when the eyes, when, when to human eyes, her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the bitter traits of, the, of her character, the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption had invested humanity with great possibilities, and in Mary's, these possibilities were realized. Through the grace, through his grace, she came to partake of the divine nature. The one who had fallen, whose name had been written, had the habitations of demons, was brought very near to the Savior in the fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was the first in the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed the risen Savior. Mary was so thankful that Jesus had decided to save her. She heard that Jesus talked about his soon death. She decided, I'm going to anoint him in honor of his death. She heard the disciples talking about 
the excitement in all Jerusalem that he was going to be crowned king soon. So Mary took a whole year's wage and went and bought the most expensive perfume she can find. Spikenard from northern India in the land of Him the Himalayas is where this grows. It's a very costly ointment. It's equivalent to one year, 300 denario, one year of a man's labor. It was a fitting for an offering for a king. And Mary, with personal, with all she could muster up, went and purchased this costly ointment to anoint her king. For she remembered how many times he had prayed to the father how, he was, how she was a captive of Satan and how she was delivered seven times from demon possession. Mary was so thankful that Jesus decided to save her. Mary was so thankful that God, through Christ, had forgiven her from her sins. That she was held captive and a slave. That she was living this immoral life and that Jesus came seven times and delivered her and cried with vehement cries to the Father to save her life. Mary knew that Jesus loved her and out of appreciation of that love, that her restoration from an impure life to a pure life, from an unlovely life to a loving life of forgiveness. <coughs> Mary observed her brother dying in a grave for four days. And in that grave, her brother started to deteriorate and stink. And Mary witnessed the power of Jesus Christ's love as he raised her brother from the grave and stored life unto her brothers and united them, Martha and Mary and Lazarus in love. Mary witnessed this power of love and out of gratitude at, pers at all at personal sacrifice, this, she bought this expensive anoint spike now. It was very effective. So she thought, I'm just going to slip in quietly and anoint him. I'm going to anoint his head and his feet, and I'll slip out quietly. So Mary goes to the feast, and on one side is Simon, the leper, and on the other side is Lazarus, her brother. So she, she comes to the feet of Jesus and suddenly with tears of repentance and love, she's stunned and she remembers all that Jesus had done for her. She begins to break the alabaster box and anoint his head and feet. And with tears, she begins to wipe them and clean them with her hair. And the smell goes out into the room. Very effective was this ointment. Within a few minutes, it had pervaded the whole entire room with all the other disciples and guests. And everybody took notice. And this notice came to them. And, and Mary, <clears throat> she was sobbing and crying there. <clears throat> The reason why this anointment was so effective because it was so expensive. And it was so expensive and effective because when you put this spike dart on the skin, it soaked in and it stayed there for 30 days. So you could not wash it off. You could take a shower and it wouldn't come off. You can, you can uh, scrub all day long and that smell would stay there for 30 days. So Mary, in her gratitude, anoints Jesus with a very effective ointment. What's the meaning of this act? When Jesus 
was going through the Garden of Gethsemane, shedding those tears when the, when the sins of the world were separating him and his father. When Jesus was being scourged the whole time, when he was nailed on the cross, he could smell that ointment. Six days after she had done this act, he was on the cross, and she remembered that somebody loved him, that somebody cared, that somebody appreciated all the things that, that he had done on behalf of the human race. And that, and that nobody could erase that from Mary's act. Nobody could, could take that ointment away from, from him. They could scourge him, they could beat him, they could nail him to the cross, but they can't wash away that ointment. And that ointment was a token of gratitude and love that Mary was able to share with the Lord. This ointment is a token of memorial, symbolizing all those that are grateful for the redeeming love of salvation throughout eternity. This was a token of memorial, a symbolized, it symbolized the, the outpouring of God's Son on behalf of the human race. <clears throat> Do you want to give him thanks like Mary did? Do you want to show him gratitude what he has done for your life? Do you want to come to the cross and receive the forgiveness, the justification, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus? By faith, do you want your guilt removed and your condemnation lifted from you? This is what Jesus did on behalf of the human race, and it's yours by faith. Let's turn now to the other character. Remember, Simon was a Pharisee. The gospel spends a lot of time talking about Pharisees. The reason Phariseeism is such a prominent topic in the, in the New Testament is because it's a religion of human nature. Phariseeism did not just exist in Jesus' time. It exists in all the Christian churches of the world. It even exists in the Seventh-day Adventist church. It would be hard-pressed not to find a Pharisee sitting in our midst today. Maybe all of us have been a Pharisee in our life. We're going to take a look at Simon. Simon was a Pharisee. It's endemic to the Christian church. In fact, it's pandemic. Simon's heart was not transformed by the Holy Spirit. He was not converted. He was not saved. I hope you're starting to get scared now. There are no Pharisees in the kingdom of heaven. They're all over the world in all the churches. They are going, they are not going to heaven. Simon has thought he was going to heaven, but he's not. He was not at that time. Pharisees are deceived. Let's look at it. John 3, verse 3. These are the words of Jesus to the Pharisee Nicodemus. Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what is the problem here? Pharisees are not born again. Verse 5. Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying about Pharisees today? Isn't he saying that unless you're born of the spirit, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you will no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven? So the problem here is that Pharisees do not have righteousness. They are not filled with the Spirit. They are not born again. You know what the problem is? 
you're listening. The problem here is that they're filled with spiritual pride. Pride. Nicodemus had pride. He was sarcastic. What? Born again? What are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with me. Because from a human point of view, they think they're better than most people. Nicodemus thought he was better than, than, than other people. So did Simon. Simon thought he knew the Lord. He knew more than the Lord. Let's read about it. Luke 7, 39. Now when the Pharisees had invited, invited him, now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is at touching him. She is a sinner. So Simon, the Pharisee, felt that, that uh, Mary was, was a condemned sinner. He judged her to be such. And in his eyes, he was righteous. Notice, but this pit of inspiration says, it was Simon who led Mary into sin. But yet, Simon, the Pharisee, was judging and condemning Mary. Notice that, that Simon did not acknowledge that Jesus was even the Messiah. He didn't even acknowledge he was even a prophet. He said that he was a prophet, then he would know what kind of woman this is. That she is the scum of the earth touching him. You know, people of the world, they have pride. They have pride of their possessions. They have pride of their attainments. They're proudful of their accomplishments in life. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about spiritual pride. It is the pride that Jesus says the last church has. That Jesus knocks on the door of the heart of the spiritual pride people of his generation. And he says that, this, that the last day message, you know what it is? That they don't have righteousness. They're naked. They don't have the forgiving, loving righteousness of Mary. They don't even know. And they are not even transformed. They're unconverted. They don't have righteousness. So Simon thought he knew more than the Lord. When you're spiritual proudful, you know more than the church members. You know more than the elders. You know more than the pastor. When you are proud, you know more than the church board. Simon thought he knew more than the church board. Thought he knew more than, than Jesus, the Lord. He thought he was able to judge. So Jesus recognizes his thoughts. Jesus reads his thoughts. It's typical Jesus was able to read thoughts. Unspoken thoughts. As evidence of his divinity, he reads Simon's thoughts. Let's read about it. Luke 4, 7, uh, verse 40 and 43. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor. Now Jesus tells a story. And just as Nathan the prophet told David a story, so now... Jesus is using a parable to reach Simon's heart. There was a, a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them loved him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. 
Then Jesus says, Simon, you're right. The one who has forgiven more, loves more. And then he turns to the woman. He says, you see this woman? The woman that everyone despised, the great sinner. They're looking with unpleasant eyes towards this woman and towards Jesus, the rest of the people in the, in the feast. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed her feet with my tears, with her tears, and wiped her, wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You have not anointed me with, with the head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say unto you, her many sins are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Simon began to shake and tremble. Simon began to realize that he was the greater debtor. He loved little because he was forgiven little. Mary's sins, for which were many, were forgiving much, and she loved much. Simon was terrified because the woman's sins were many, were forgiven, but he was a proud Pharisee that was not forgiven. She was pardoned, and he was not. She was on her way to heaven, and he was and he was on his way to hell. He knew it at that time. My dear friends, there will be no Pharisees in the kingdom of heaven who have not been born again. There will be no one in the kingdom of heaven who has spiritual pride or any other kind of pride. My friend, if you pray that God will deliver you from your pride, you will be there in the kingdom of heaven. It is pride that keeps Jesus from our redemption, and, and it's, it's pride that keeps Jesus from clothing our nakedness. It's spiritual pride that keeps the Holy Spirit from anointing our eyesight so we can see ourselves. It is spiritual pride that keeps the Lord of glory away from our lives. By the way, you're going to see both of these people in heaven because the pit of inspiration says that Simon repented and he became a lowly disciple of Jesus Christ. He got rid of his pride. He did not try from, to second guess the Lord anymore. It's spiritual pride. It's being Simon was a criticizer. He criticized that woman. He condemned her. Pharisees, Phariseeism is a religion in which you become a critical judge and you condemn other people. Brothers and sisters, if we are criticizing each other if we are not moved with forgiving love that Mary had the grace of Jesus then we are in a lost condition if we are a criticizer then we are a Pharisee God doesn't want that in our lives God came to deliver us from critical judgmental, condemning attitudes. That is not God's way. God's way is for us to grow in love and nourishment and acceptance of each other. God's way is the way that he said to Mary when she was knelt before the elders of the church and they, went to, they came to stone her. I think I would like to think that was Mary there that day. And then 
Jesus said, where are your accusers? He says, she says, I have none, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Jesus had non-condemning love towards Mary. We must have that same love towards each other. We must not point the finger and criticize. We must love one another. There was another problem. As you know, the ointment came and, and affected the whole entire guest there. And one of the members of the disciples, Judas Aristot, said, what purpose this waste? Why this waste? He said it could have been sold and given to the poor. Why this waste? Was it a waste? They, and as soon as the, the fragrance came out, they saw Jesus was criticized. The, the woman was criticized for doing the act, a wasteful act, they said. And it cost so much money, they wasted this money. And then Jesus was, was criticized for allowing her to do it. And he said, leave her alone. She has anointed my body for the burial. But, but Judas Aristot tried to, tried to assign a worthy motive behind his complaint. It could have been given to the poor. But the Bible says he cared nothing about the poor. They were angry, indignant, they were, they were the disciples, why this waste? You know what was going through the mind of Jesus at that time when they complained? In six days, he would be nailed to the cross. And they didn't know it. Mary had poured out the oil on his head, and they criticized him for doing it. The disciples became angry. Why did they waste this money? Was it a waste? Was the greatest sacrifice ever made a waste? The greatest sacrifice, Jesus knew what the greatest sacrifice, it was himself to save a lost race. He knew it wasn't a waste. And you know what else Jesus knew? that his father had given everything in one gift to the lost race, you and I. Jesus knew that the greatest sacrifice that ever was made was not only the sacrifice that he made, but it was the sacrifice his father made on our behalf. Do you think it didn't bother the father to give up his son? Would you give up your son for a rebellious people, for a race, for sinners? Would you give up your son? Would you just give up your son for an, a worthy cause in this life? The father did. The father gave everything that he could possibly give in one gift, and that was the Son, his only begotten Son, that he existed throughout eternity, and they had oneness in their relationship. It was this special person God the Father gave in one gift to us all. And as that alabaster box was broken and, it, and, the, and, the, and the fragrance of that lovely perfume pervaded the whole room, it was a symbol of God's love that he gave his only begotten son lavishly. He pulled away and let the separation that he had for, for eternity, the oneness, come apart for you and I. 
Jesus could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. But he, by faith, could smell that fragrance of you today. He could smell the redeemed. He could smell the effectiveness of the lost race being redeemed. The Marys, the forgiven. And he was willing to give all in this one gift for the guilty race. It wasn't too much longer after that the Lord had ascended 50 days later to heaven. And as the disciples stood around, we had the Lord of glory in our midst and we let him go. We let him go. He was right here with us. We let the Lord of glory go. They were no longer accusing Mary of the waste. We complained, we criticized the Lord for being anointed. We let the Lord of glory go out of our hands, out of our midst. The greatest sacrifice that ever was made, was it a waste, was the cross of Calvary, the death of Jesus, the greatest sacrifice ever made, a waste for you? Listen to this. It's a waste if you're not saved. The greatest sacrifice that it was ever made, if you're spurning the grace of God in your life, then you're wasting it. If you're not allowing the Lord Jesus to cleanse you from sin on a daily basis, then you're wasting it. The greatest sacrifice that ever was made was made for you, my brethren. You. Was made for me. So what do we do with Jesus? Do we spurn the grace of God? Or do we allow him to lift the gate, cleanse the heart? And do we allow the greatest sacrifice to penetrate our lives in righteousness? I'm inviting you to allow Jesus to be at the center of your life today, that the great sacrifice of his love that the Father poured out for you will not be a waste, but will be salvation for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for allowing him to come to this sin-dark world and live a life of faith Thank you that he has overcome sin in this world and that he's made the greatest sacrifice, that you have made the greatest sacrifice on behalf of all of us here today. Father, we pray that that sacrifice will not be in vain, that everyone will cherish it here today and that it will bring us to the kingdom of heaven and bring righteousness and the spirit into our lives so that we can be born again and set free from spiritual pride just as Simon was. Lord, it's spiritual pride that keeps you away. And I'm asking you today to lift the spiritual pride from every heart here today. And I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and set us free from spiritual pride is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.